Hey, this is Jamie with Snowmeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about my top 10 favorite campaign games, as well as a number of design notes and kind of design decisions that go into making a campaign game. Just to start off with a quick definition, a campaign game, in my opinion, is a game that has a connective, connected narrative over multiple sessions, often scenarios, um, and it has persistent elements. There are a few games that I'll mention kind of in the honorable mentions that don't quite fit that category, even though I, I almost consider them campaign games. And so I'll, I'll delve into that in a minute. Also, I want to say right from the beginning that I, uh, even though I don't include games that I design or publish on this list, Stillmeyer Games does have some campaign and uh, some campaign games. The first one, uh, or the biggest one that is just a full campaign game is Charterstone. Charterstone is a legacy game that is also a campaign game over 12 sessions. It is a village building game for one to six players and uh, probably the hardest game that I've ever designed, but I had a lot of fun doing so and uh, people can th continue to discover. We continue to reprint it and it is still available um, in digital format as well, or it is now available in digital format. Also, I co-designed Scythe, The Rise of Fenris with Ryan Lopez. This is a campaign expansion for, uh, for Scythe, obviously, and um, it is uh, not a legacy game. It, it doesn't have permanence, but it does have persistence and a connected narrative, as well as some branching paths. And it is an eight-game campaign that is fully replayable as often as you want, and it's fully modular. You can pull the stuff out of this campaign and place it in future games of Scythe if you really, really like certain elements. So that's Scythe, The Rise of Fenris. There are also solo campaigns, not designed by me, but designed by the wonderful Altama Factory team, uh, both for Viticulture and most recently in Tapestry Plans Employees. There's a wonderful, I think it's a five game uh, campaign in uh, how many scenarios? Four, uh, five scenarios, yeah, five scenario campaign in Tapestry Plans Employees. So those are the games from Stillmeyer Games. Um, some campaign games that I haven't played, and there are many more that could have been on this haven't played list, but some that I haven't played are Shadowrun Crossfire, Betrayal Legacy, The King's Dilemma, My City, uh, the campaign portion of Cloud Age. I've played Cloud Age, the game, just standalone. Um, and the same goes for Expedition to New Dale, Oh My Goods, and Maracaibo. I've played Oh My Goods and Maracaibo, but not the, the uh, campaign scenario, campaign modules for, for those games. Two upcoming campaign games that I'm excited about but I haven't played yet because they haven't gotten to me yet are The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Role Player Adventures. Now on to some honorable mentions. These are campaigns that I played at least a portion of. I think there are a few of them that I played all the way through, some of them only a little bit. Um, the Seventh Continent. The, so these are ones that I have played that are honorable mentions. Seventh Continent, Dragonfire, Machi Kuro Legacy, Seafall, Pandemic Legacy Seasons 1 and 2, Gloomhaven, Legacy of Dragonholt, Imperial Assault, Forgotten Waters, which I wasn't quite sure if I should consider that a campaign game. It's real close, but I don't know if there's actually a connected narrative between the different scenarios in the game. Journeys in Middle-Earth, Tainted Grail, The Crew, and The Crew was the toughest one because The Crew would be on this list, but I realized as I was making the top 10 list that The Crew doesn't actually have persistent elements. Um, you get better at the game, but you aren't actually carrying over anything from scenario to scenario in the crew, even though I love the micro missions in the crew. Um, and last, Arkham Horror LCG. Those are the honorable mentions. Now let's jump into the top 10, and I will kind of talk about a game and probably talk about a uh, design element that, um, that went into the, the thought process for this game. And I'll, I'll probably have some elements left over that I'll go into at the end of the video. So at number 10 is Near and Far. Uh, Near and Far is, at least the version I played, was a competitive campaign. We played the competitive campaign. I believe it was a 10-game campaign. I think there might be a cooperative version now. I think there's a solo version. There's like, you can do one-off uh, games of Near and Far, but we played the competitive campaign that I believe was 10 games. Um, and I guess I'll, one of the topics that I wanted to mention briefly is uh, cooperative versus competitive in these campaign games. Uh, I, there's a mix on this list. I think it can work both ways. I think competitive is harder to design uh, for a campaign game because you are, are trying to keep things balanced despite all these different branching paths and and uh, persistent elements, which I think it can be easy if there's a player who's winning and they're winning because not only they're playing better, but because they have better stuff that is carrying over from game to can game to can game to game. That's harder to balance. Um, against all the players who are not playing as well, but you also want them to feel from game to game that they are still competitive. 
And uh, near and far, I thought accomplished that really well. I thought it was a fun, uh, competitive game um, where I don't know. I, I don't remember ever having the feeling of falling too far behind in near and far. It's a game basically where you are uh, spending some time in a village and then you are venturing out from town. I think it's called you know, the town. There are worker placement actions in the town. And then you're kind of building up to get ready to go on an adventure. And you go out on an adventure on a map. It has Ryan Lockett's kind of trademark um, map style books. And you go out on this map and you venture out and go. You read storybooks. You, have, you encounter different uh, creatures and enemies along the path. And then when you're ready, you have to go back and go to town. Uh, when, when, usually when you run out of life, you go back to town. And I, I love the skill test mechanism in this game. In particular, that's like the standout thing about this game, about near and far in particular, in that you, you build up this health while you're in town. And there's this nice tension of when, do you, when is the exact moment that you go venture out? Because if you, uh, and this is where the competitive nature comes in, if you wait too long, someone else might venture out before you and they might get to the thing that you were hoping to get. But if you can build up more life, you can go farther out on the map. You can last longer out on the map. And the skill test plays into that because even if you fail a skill test, you can spend extra health to still accomplish the skill test. But as you do that, you are shortening your journey, shortening your adventure. Um, and one thing of note here is that you are going on multiple adventures each game. It's not like you're building up to one adventure one on the map each game. You're typically going out there three or four times over the course of the game. But yeah, I think I think cooperative versus competitive is a, is a great consideration. Maybe I'll return to that later on this list, but I thought Near and Far did a great job in the in the competitive format. That's number 10, Near and Far. And number nine on the list is Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, this is a competitive campaign game played over seven games, like there are seven books in the Harry Potter world and or over the, the Harry Potter, the core Harry Potter story. And I had a great time with this. I actually entered this game in a, in a little bit of a weird way because I had heard that some of the beginning scenarios were really, really easy, almost too easy to be engaging for an experienced gamer. And so I jumped right in in game seven with some friends who had played up to game seven, but hadn't beat game seven. So I played game seven a few times and then I went back and played through the whole campaign with some other friends. We played games one through seven. Uh, fully competitive, and it's a deck building game. And there are persistent elements to it, and there are things that you're unlocking from game to game, but it's not a legacy game. You can put those, those elements back in the envelopes and play through the campaign again. And it, while it, I, I think Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, Battle really does a great job of introducing how to play the game, um, and ease of play over the course of the campaign because it does start off very easy and very simple but i don't mind that i i, I would prefer to go into a campaign game with a very low barrier to entry um, and have it ramp up in difficulty and complexity over the course of the campaign i think the crew does this really well and this is why i wanted to put the crew on this list but uh but couldn't because it doesn't have persistent elements but harry potter hogwarts battle does that really well i think um it really it, it it brings you into the campaign in a really nice way, and one well, actually no I'll, I'll bring it up with a different uh, there's another design element I'll bring up on, a, on an upcoming game that I'll mention in a second. Um, uh, I think that's the main thing that I want to mention for Harry Potter Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. I will say that um, yeah I'll mention it for this one. So the the one other element to consider for these campaign games, especially if they're cooperative is the idea of failing forwards if you lose a scenario versus having to repeat that scenario. And I have a whole video about this. I won't delve too deep into this topic. My general preference is that you, whether you win or lose the scenario, that you always move forwards and, uh, and that you have consequences if you lost and you have a, a, a benefit if you won. That's my, my definite, definite preferred way of doing it. But while talking to uh, the guys over at Perspective, uh, there's a link below to a video that I very recently had with the, these guys. We kind of talked about this a little bit and came to the conclusion that there are definitely two types of gamers. There are the types of gamers, maybe often from the video game world, where they are used to encountering a difficult level and the fun for them is to replay that level over and over again until they accomplish it, until they complete it. And for those types of gamers, I think failing forwards isn't good, isn't ideal. I think they might definitely prefer to replay the tougher missions in Harry, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle until they accomplish them. Um, but there's a whole other subset of gamers, perhaps bigger, definitely me, who prefers to just fail forwards and continue moving forwards in the campaign even if you lose a scenario. That's my preference. But that's number nine, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Really enjoy that game. 
And number eight is another competitive, another cooperative deck building game, and that is Aeons and Legacy. This is the first Legacy game on this list. And this is a big decision point if you're designing a campaign game. Do you want those persistent elements to be permanent? That's the what makes a Legacy game. If there is permanence, if there's really, if it features permanence, if that's a big part of the game itself, um, versus... Uh, a campaign game where you have persistent elements, but they can be completely reset. And that even includes surprises that you unlock along the way. And there are some great surprises in Aeons and Legacy that you unlock along the way. But your decision point is, like in The Rise of Fenris, can you reset those unlocks and put them back in the box, different back in the tuck boxes? Or are those unlocks permanent? Are they like stickers that you're pulling out and putting on cards or writing on cards, things like that? Um, and Zen Legacy, I mean, it takes a core game that is very solid, a, a very solid uh, game where you're kind of building a deck and together fighting against a big bad boss. And, um, and it brings in some wonderful le legacy elements where you are modifying cards, or cards, you're getting new cards in the deck. The decisions that you make determine, uh, can impact the cards that you're bringing uh, back into the supply. And probably my favorite thing re related to the, uh, the campaign in and Zen Legacy is... Uh, the idea that, and this ties back into failing forwards a little bit, even though this is a game where if you fail a, game, a scenario, you have to repeat it at least once. I think it's just once. Um, there are kind of mini bosses that you encounter along the way. So they're cards that will come out of the deck that you have to defeat. They're fairly difficult, but they're not the big boss. And oftentimes, if you don't defeat them, they... Well, almost always, if you don't defeat them, they stay in the deck for future games. But if you do defeat them, then they're out of the deck forever. And so that's a wonderful decision point to make in a campaign game. Um, yes, we have this mini boss that we don't need to defeat to win this scenario. But if we don't, then that mini boss is going to show up probably in a future game and will be really annoying to deal with. And some of those cards in Anne's and Legacy even evolve. So if you don't deal with that boss, the boss gets stronger in, in future games. Um, games. So I think that's a wonderful decision point to include in a campaign game. Do we deal with this thing now or do we put it off until later and deal with it later? Um, so yeah, that's uh, Aeons and Legacy, my number eight favorite campaign game. And number seven is Mechs versus Minions. This is uh, an, another, you know, it, it's a beautiful production, beautiful, be beautiful production. And I'm sorry as I'm talking about these games that I don't have them to show to you. These are all games that I have owned at some point, but no longer own because they're campaign games. They're, most of them are, are games that I have only wanted to play once. Um, Next vs. Min Minions is one that is, is a lot of fun to play. It's one that I might, might actually want to return to and play again someday. It is a cooperative uh, programming game where you are each programming um, a, a, a beautiful mech that is going out onto this map and fighting minions. And I don't always love programming games, but it works so well in this zany cooperative format where you each program your different things and then activate it and see how it goes. And things can go terribly right and also terribly wrong. Um, and the, there's fun in that in a cooperative game. In a competitive game, I don't think that would be as fun, not nearly as fun. But the number one thing I loved about Mechs, Mechs vs. Minions was the tutorial. And that is the case with several of the games on this list. A great tutorial can make or break a campaign game because campaign games often have a ton of rules that you need to understand to be able to play all these different elements that you'll discover over the course of the campaign. But if the tutorial eases you into the core gameplay, um, I'm just much more likely to get it to the table. I'm much more likely to in enjoy those first few games. And for many of these games, it, uh, many on the honorable mentions, I've only played one game of them because it was just too much for the first game. But if that tutorial is satisfying and can ease you into the gameplay, as Mechs vs. Minions does incredibly well, um, I highly recommend, even if you don't play Mechs vs. Minions, check out the tutorial to see how well they do. It's fantastic. Um, and I've heard the same about Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. I haven't played that, but I've heard the tutorial for that is fantastic. I have a few other games on here where it's fantastic. And I kind of mentioned this with Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. I don't know if it had a great tutorial, but it definitely eased you into the game, into the campaign really well. But yeah, Next vs. Minions, fantastic tutorial. I think that's really important for a campaign. Next up, number six, is Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. This is my favorite of the Pandemic Legacies for a very specific reason that I'll mention in a second. But overall, um, it, it is, I, I don't know, it was just a, a wonderful, epic conclusion to the Pandemic Legacy trilogy. I think they made a bold move by making it a, a, a prequel instead of a sequel to one and two. And there are some... 
awesome mini games. I don't want to spoil anything, but there are some awesome, awesome mini games that happen over the course of the Pandemic Legacy Season 1 campaign that I really, really enjoyed. But number, my number one favorite element of Pandemic Legacy Season 0 was the fail forwards element of it. That for most of the missions, uh, it, it, the game is played over 12 months. And if you outright fail a month, if you don't do anything, if you, if you don't complete any of the objectives for that month, um, or oftentimes if there are three objectives, if you only complete one objective, then you fail, you have to repeat it. Um, however, if you complete all of the objectives or all but one, you get to move forwards and you move forwards often with the consequences of your actions. I love this. I mean, that alone, it really, really elevated Pandemic Legacy Season Zero over the other ones for me, both because of that fail forwards element, but also because of the length. And I think length is a crucial part of a campaign game to, to consider as you're designing them. I don't necessarily want to say outright that there is a right or wrong length to a campaign, but um, I think, A, it helps to have clarity on the length from the beginning. Is this campaign game going to be something that's going to take us 20 games to get through, or will it be a five-game campaign, a 10-game campaign? Um, that I think clarity on that length is really, really helpful uh, so players know what they're getting into when they sit down to play. There, oftentimes, players have to decide, am I going to play this with a significant other that I know that I can get to the, this to the table with on an ongoing basis, or roommates or housemates that I know that I can get to it on a regular basis, or is this going to be a game where... Each session will be two hours, and uh, I have a group that wants to play it, but we can only meet once every month or once every few weeks. Just having clarity on the length, I think, is incredibly helpful to give players the opportunity to get it to, to, get it to the table with the right people. But also, there's the length, the element of how many scenarios are there? How long will this take us to play? And I think campaign games, more and more I see campaign games bo boasting about campaign length being longer, but I think that is not necessarily a good thing. It can be exciting as a gamer to see, oh, this is a 40-hour campaign. Look at all that, all this game that I'm going to get out of my $100. I'm going to get 40 hours out of this. But are you really going to spend 40 hours on a game? There are games where you'll say yes to that. There certainly are. Um, but uh, I think it's almost better to say you can get 40 hours out of this game, but a campaign, one of, a campaign played in this, in this world only takes... 10 hours or for even five hours. And that way you can get excited both about the, the size of the campaign, the overall campaign, the overall story, the overall world, but you know that you can sit down and play a single campaign in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I think that can be incredibly helpful and more appealing and more welcoming um, to gamers. I, I Obviously, I have a very defined opinion about this. Your opinion may definitely vary. I'd love to hear your opinion about length and clarity on length in the comments here. So that, again, is Pandemic Legacy Season Zero, my number six favorite campaign game. At number five is one that I wasn't sure where it would end up on this list or if it even would end up in the top ten, and that is Risk Legacy. But I had to, I, I don't know, for me, I had to put it up here because I just had so many wonderful, mem memorable moments of playing through Risk Legacy. It was one of the first campaign games I played. It was the first Legacy game I played. And it hit some so many of these Legacy sweet spots where... You are opening up these amazing packets that immediately have a permanent impact on the world. Um, and it's just, a, I, I don't want to talk about it without giving away spoilers, but there, there's so much, so many things that you are changing on the map in Risk Legacy that are incredibly memorable uh, whenever you make those changes and impactful. Like you are making huge decisions about in the map on Risk Legacy. And this is in a, in a competitive game. Rob Davio came out of the gate with a competitive Legacy game, which is incredibly difficult. And I, I think you just knocked it out of the park. I think it's a wonderful game to play through the campaign. The one knock on it, maybe a little bit, is that there isn't a connected narrative. This is another topic that I want to talk about on this list. It, are you going to have a connected narrative brand, pulling together all of these uh, different scenarios? And there is. I mean, there, there is a story that you're, that you're creating along the way. Um, and that's why it qualifies for my list as a campaign game. But... Uh, it, there, there isn't really like a conclusion to it. There, it, at least as far as I found, we played through a number, a number of games and we we unlocked all the stuff. And at that point, we we're like, okay, we're done. And there wasn't like a, a narrative element saying, oh, you need to play another campaign so you can do this. Um, and I, I think this is a, a key decision point to make when you're designing a campaign game. Uh, like how how firm and how linear will the narrative be to pull players forwards? Um, or do you want to go with a much more branching path narrative? 
um, or have it be connected to the unlocks. Like basically, if you play, all, if you after you unlock all the stuff in Risk Legacy, you can, if you want, just stop playing. You don't have to play through all eleven or twelve games. Um, I tried to do both in Charterstone. So Charterstone has a branching path narrative where each choice you make, uh, basically at the end of every scenario, you have two different choices that you can make. And each of those choices will lead you in a slightly different direction. Also, the village building itself has branching paths that, that, that you're branching out into. Um, but at the same time, there, that the narrative along the way is a set narrative. It's 12 games and... Uh, even though there are branching paths, they're more like a DNA strand where they're interwoven along the way as they lead towards a Game 12 conclusion. Um, and, and I kind of like that method that I, that I did with Charter. So I, I, I think that's a, a decent way to go to have a, a set number of games, a connected narrative over the course of those games, but have many, many branching paths along the way so players feel like that they are in charge of the narrative, even though there's still a good story hopefully being told to those players along the way. So that is, uh, that is Risk Legacy, my number five. And number four is the first in this category of, a, uh, of an expansion campaign, and that is... Oh, and actually, I should have held up. I, I still have the Pandemic Legacy Season Zero box. should have held that up uh, at number six. This was my number six favorite Legacy game. Um, but at number four, I have Shards of Infinity shadow of salvation this is an expand a campaign a cooperative campaign expansion pack and it is awesome um i i uh, campaign expansions don't always appeal to me there are a few and actually i totally forgot one on this list i totally forgot to put uh space base uh shy pluto totally should have been on this list so i'll talk about both of them right now um Shard, uh, this is uh, shadow of salvation and shy pluto both are actually would be right around the spot on this list they are both uh campaign expansions one is competitive the shy pluto is is uh, uh, competitive shadow of salvation is cooperative and the thing that i really really love about this other than the branching paths so it does have branching paths uh so you can completely play through the campaign in the opposite way fight the different uh, different bosses that you didn't choose if you want to play it again um the, and but also i love in this that it is a short campaign i'm talking about length i guess with a few of these elements but it is a very short campaign i believe it is four games three or four games, and you do have to replay them if you if you lose, which is fine, uh, but you get more and more powerful every time you do that. But I love that it is just a short campaign. I think we played this in two sittings, uh, two player, and had a blast with it. And I love that we were able to get through that campaign in a just a short amount of time. Um, I, I love that, I absolutely love that about this game. Also just happen to love Shards of Infinity. I think it plays really, really well. But I think this is a great example actually too, if you have a dueling game, um, to, you can potentially turn that dueling game into a cooperative campaign game and offer a whole new experience uh, for maybe couples who don't like to duel against each other but love to work together with each other. Um, let me see if there's a, a game design element that I can pull in here for this as well. Uh, the Let's see, this isn't a le legacy game. Um, oh, okay, yeah, here's one. This... So one other thing to consider, I think, with campaign games is keeping each session or each scenario fresh. Keep it feeling fresh because you don't want players to feel like they are doing the same thing over and over again. This was my problem with Gloomhaven. I always felt like every scenario, even though it was designed with different monsters, every scenario that I played through seven scenarios was go into a room, kill all the bad guys, and get out. And I know it's more than that. I know that's that's oversimplifying what Gloomhaven is, but that was my experience with it. And I wanted something different. I, I, I want scenarios that feel distinctly different while still keeping my enjoyment of the core game. And I think Shards of Infinity did this really well with the different bosses. So the focus every time was on the different bosses, and uh, which were vastly different in what they could do because the bosses combined two different decks of cards. So you're combining one, maybe even three decks of cards, either two or three decks of cards to make each of those scenarios feel very different and can lead you to doing very different things based on that scenario. I think Shards of Infinity did a great job of designing these scenarios to feel different. And again, in staying short, they were successful in doing this. If this had been a 20-game campaign, inevitably, some of those bosses would have ended up feeling very similar to the other ones. But instead, they kept it short, kept it focused, and each boss feels distinctly different. Um, so yeah, that's my number four, Shards of Infinity, Shadow of Salvation. And I'll sh throw in there... Um, I think it's the something of Shy Pluto for, uh, for Space Space. I enjoyed that campaign as well. But obviously, it didn't occur to me for this list. And number three is The Rise of Queensdale. This is another um, competitive village building campaign. It's for one to four players instead of one to six players like Charterstone. 
But I got excited about this because I love the idea of comp- uh, building a village in a, in a legacy format. Um, and I was, was very curious to see how the Rise of Queensdale did it differently than, um, than Charterstone. And they did. It's a completely different core game. And the core game, I think this is so important, I think, for a legacy game or, or a campaign game. That the core game itself is fun. Like before you design the whole campaign, make sure the core game itself, the thing that players will be doing over and over each uh, game, um, is a lot of fun and is interesting and is variable. And I think Rise of Queensdale did a fantastic job with that. You're kind of moving around this board and uh, discovering stuff, even in your own little village. You're building stuff. You are discovering herbs and, and things as you as you explore out. So there's this neat explore, exploration element to this village building game. Um, but th- there, I also really love it, Rise of Queensdale, these mini games that you unlock that different players control. Um, we, we had a few different mini games that we unlocked and, and it, they were just a lot of fun. Whenever a player decided, okay, I have this mini game, we're all gonna play it right now because they were they were often group mini games. Everyone was involved in these mini games. That was really really cool. It's clear the designers had a lot of fun designing the Rise of Queensdale. Um, let me see. Oh, well, one topic, yeah, that I that I wanted to go into a little bit is the topic of spoilers. Um, I think that's kind of a challenge with these campaign games. People want to talk about them. They want to share their experiences, but they also want to be respectful of others and not spoil anything. This is a tough thing to design around. I, I don't even know if you can really design around it. It's more about the the community that you design around the game. With Charterstone, we have two different Facebook groups for Charterstone. We have the core group, and we have very clear spoiler guidelines in that group. And we also have a full spoiler group. So people want to just go there and talk about the game the game in full spoiler mode. They are welcome to do so in that group. It's very clear that it is a spoiler group. Um, that's one way to do it. The, the open world game that I'm working on is, is a campaign game, and I'm kind of hoping that players choose to share their experiences with each other in that game. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if they will. I don't know if they they'll be too worried about spoilers. And I, I at the same time I want them to be worried about spoilers. So it's a tough balance there. I want players to share it and share their experiences, share their stories, but also be uh, respectful of others who haven't had those those chances to explore those those stories yet. So I'm, I'm curious what you think about spoilers and campaign games. I have two more games left here and a few more minutes here to chat about these games. Um, Number two on this list is the most recent one that I've played. It was very tough to decide between really these top three. I love these top three and even the top four. So many great games on this list. So many memorable games. But number two, I did put Sleeping Gods. I don't have my copy right now because I lent it out to my friend Joe. Um, But uh, Sleeping Gods, the new game from Ryan Lockett, is an incredible experience. Um, I really, really had a blast playing through the first campaign of Sleeping Gods. I, to the point that I thought about doing another video about it because there are so many cool things that we, that, that the cool design choices that Ryan made along the way, and hardly any of them are even spoilers. Um, they're, they're just really elegant design choices that, that made the game fascinating and interesting. And the, the biggest part about it, about it is how open it is. It is a quest-driven open world game. Basically, you can go wherever you want on the map. You could, you could literally just sail your boat around the map um, for games and games before stopping anywhere if you wanted to. You could just sail and sail, and that is okay. Um, but you can also stop off at all these little story points along the way, and many of them will say, like, do you have a card that says pepperoni? And if you have a card that says pepperoni, one of these quest cards, then you would read a certain passage based on that. Um, and if you don't, oftentimes that means that you need to go out there and look for the pepperoni quest and find that pepperoni quest and once you have it then you have that quest you can accomplish it and then bring it back to this one place to accomplish that quest there there are many quests that work that way but there's so many different keywords so many quests i think we counted easily over 100 quests that we hadn't even looked at after we finished the first campaign in this game and so this ties into the thing i was talking earlier that there are there's probably 40 or 50 hours of gameplay in sleeping gods but each individual campaign it's probably around 10 to 12 hours. We played two player. That might vary. Maybe that's a little bit. Maybe it was more like 15 hours. But I love that we were able to get a, a wonderful experience in a reasonable amount of time, but know that we can put this game away and come back in maybe three or six months and play through a campaign that will be very, very different than that first campaign, unlocking stuff that we did not discover that first campaign and have and, and still have a fun, a ton of fun playing the game. Um, I can go on and on about Sleeping Gods. I, I think Ryan did a fantastic job with it. And uh, if you're interested in a truly open um, a, a campaign game, I highly recommend Sleeping Gods. 
Let me see if there's anything else that I want to say about that game, because I don't want to spoil anything. Oh, actually, you know, there is there's one thing specific to Sleeping Gods in that you are playing as multiple characters. And so this is an interesting design point, I think. Uh, are, a, are you going to associate each character, each player with a character at all? You, you could choose not to do that. Or you can choose to have each player associate with a very specific character, have them play as that character, have them fully embrace the, the world, the personality of that character. Um, or will you have that pl person play more characters? And the reason that you might want to do this is for balancing. Basically, there are, there are nine different characters in Sleeping Gods. One is the captain. The captain's always in the middle of the table for any player to control. And then you divide up the other characters based on the number of players. And uh, I th I'm pretty sure that Ryan did this for balance reasons. You need access to all these characters for their different attributes. Um, and even though I didn't ever feel like I was one specific character, I did feel like I was telling the story of the four characters that I controlled in our two-player campaign. Um, which surprised me a little bit because in general and in the number one game that i'll mention here there's a i had a specific character and it was fun just being that character for the campaign but it wasn't as much of a deterrent for sleeping gods as i thought i liked that i had the options of the different characters that i was playing so that's a, a design design point that you can make that you can think about while you play or while you design a, a campaign game if you are finally at number one is the big boy clank legacy um, I've mentioned this many times, you've probably seen Clank on my, my videos. I think Clank Legacy is just a wonderful campaign game. Um, and it is a legacy game, you're, you're, you're building the board as you go. There's so many stickers that you're putting on the board to build. It isn't a dungeon in, in this Clank, it's, you're kind of building the world that you're exploring. Um, and the board is double-sided, so there's two sides to the board, two very different worlds that you're exploring. Some games will be on one side, some games will be on the other side. Um, and there's so many branching paths that you're discovering based on how you are putting stickers on the board. Uh, and branching path is an element that I love about the core game of Clank, and they really even up that even more because you are building those paths on the board as you explore more and more deeper and deeper into Clank Legacy. Uh, it is a deck building game, and I love the deck building in Clank Legacy. It's also a bag building game. The number one thing that I think that stands out, though, about my experience with Clank Legacy, other than the humor, the humor was, was great. I, I think the writing, I think, was excellent. Uh, is that it is a competitive campaign game that felt cooperative. Uh, my coworker Alex and friend Alex has called it a semi-competitive game because even though you are playing competitively and trying to win, there are many decisions that you're making along the way that you're kind of making as a group, both in an emergent sense where I might say, okay, guys, I'm, I really want to go after this mission. I'm going to have fun doing that. Are you okay with that? That type. And also, there is another corporation that you are all competing against. And so this adds to this feeling of cooperation where if you as a group make certain decisions along the way that benefit this other corporation, you will all suffer as a result. And so the game incentivizes you to work together to uh, be a better corporation than this other, uh, this other Clank corporation. I forget the name of it in the, in the campaign. Um, but I think that was really, really clever in a, in, a, in a competitive campaign game to have a third party entity that all the players dislike and don't want to do well. And that leads to players feeling like they are working together, even in a uh, in, even in a competitive game. I do something a little bit like this in Charterstone, but it's much more overt in Clank Legacy. Um, in fact, I, we do a little bit something like this also inside the Rise of Fenris. But again, it's it's done, I think, even better in Clank Legacy. Uh, so yeah, so that is that is my number one campaign game. Let me see if there's any design elements that I have not covered here. Uh, I talked a little bit about doing expansions versus core games um, in, in the Shards of Infinity example. I think generally I prefer to get the campaign in the big box. I'm more likely to buy it if it is a game that is clearly designed to be a campaign game from the start. Uh, but I don't mind this format. I mean, this format is very accessible. You can buy Shards of Infinity, see if you like it, and if you do like it, uh, you can spend another $15 on, on the, the campaign expansion. Uh, there's also kind of the Alexander Pfister model. I mentioned a number of games uh, like uh, Maracaibo, Cloud Age, Oh My Goods, uh, Expedition to New Deal. Expedition to New Deal may be the exception to that. But these are all uh, expansion mod, either modules that are in the core box that are campaign, or they are expansion modules that are that are campaign. That's an interesting format. For some reason, it just doesn't get me as excited to play just a solid Euro game over and over again. Um, but it is a, a, a format to consider. And what else? Oh, I didn't talk about a setup and cleanup. So this is one actually that we experienced with Clank Legacy. 
I have a, a gaming table that is dual layered. And so oftentimes, if we're playing a campaign game, we will just leave it in the bottom layer of the table and play through it. Um, and that is great. In, 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 in that way, uh, you don't have to worry about setup or cleanup. But as a designer, I think you should still think about uh, how difficult it is to set up or clean up your campaign game because there are many people who probably will be cleaning it up after every session. And a number of these games don't do it very well, I'll be honest. I, I think they, they make setup and cleanup kind of a beast as you're getting more and more components over the course of the campaign. Um, and so I just think that's something to think about as a designer. Think about the idea that most people or many people will be cleaning up that game every time they play or almost every time they play and then resetting it up. And if you're giving them more and more components over the course of the campaign to put on the table, uh, that could detract from the experience because they are having to set up and clean it up. Maybe I'm overestimating that. Maybe not many people actually have to set up and clean up, but uh, I'm guessing it's still a fair number of people. What else? Um, I think I've covered almost... Oh, the last thing is uh, a solo play. Are you going to include solo play in the campaign? Which I think nowadays is a great idea to include solo play. Um, I think that's the reason actually why some, why some of these games have become very, very popular because they offer the ability for you to just sit down and play th through the campaign. I think that can be... That's a great opportunity for campaign games to a, either be great at solo or at two players um, and also be able to scale up. But being able to scale down to that solo play for people who who want to just play through the campaign alone um, or by themselves. I think that's a, that's a wonderful addition to these campaign games. All right. I've got a little bit over time today. Thank you for joining me for, for this deep discussion about campaign games. Hopefully it's given you good, some good food for thought. I'd love to hear your opinions, your stances, your perspectives on these different topics I, I mentioned. And if you want to list your top three or top five or top 10 favorite campaign games, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. Thanks.